Good evening and welcome. You're watching We the People. I'm Rishika Barua. Following the horrific rape and murder of the Kolkata doctor, the West Bengal government has now passed the Aparajita Bill, introducing the death penalty for rape in cases where the victim dies or is left in a permanent vegetative state. The bill also calls for time-bound probe, fast-track courts and special task force. Now, heinous crime against women have prompted other state governments to also pass laws approving the death sentence in cases of rape in the past. Before the West Bengal government, the Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra governments had passed laws prescribing the death penalty for rape. The Shakti bill, for instance, in Maharashtra demands death for rape and also calls for harsher punishments in cases of acid attacks. The Disha Act in Andhra Pradesh mandates a seven-day completion of probe and a two-weeks completion of trial. But neither bill has received the mandatory president assent and therefore just remain pieces of paper. Since the Nirbhaya case, India has ramped up punishments for rape over the last decade. But we still have an under 30% conviction rate for rape. According to official government data between 2018 and 2022, it's somewhere around 28%. While stringent laws against rape are welcome, they alone cannot help stem sexual assault. Executions in India are extremely rare, but remember Nirbhaya's rapist did hang. Has anything changed after that? Now as protests rage on the street once again, it's death for rape that has become real. Is it really a real deterrent or is it just a knee-jerk reaction to quell the agitation? To answer some of these questions, joining me tonight on We The People, Dr. Kiran Bedi, former IPS officer and former Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. We have Sushmita Dev, Rajya Sabha uh, MP of the TMC, Priyanka Tibrival, spokesperson of the BJP in Bengal, Yashavardhan Azad, former IPS officer and Shobha Gupta, senior advocate of the Supreme Court. Kiran Bedi, I want to begin by asking you, you know, since the Nirbhaya case, uh, the Justice Varma Committee proposed many changes. The law on rape has changed a couple of times in the last decade, but nothing has changed on the ground. Why do you think that's the case? Look, the laws are there. And the new laws which have come, the Sangeeta laws which have come, in fact, have tightened the system. What has happened is that we've not executed the laws properly. And there are a lot of procedural delays. Issues is in delay in the procedures. Adjournments is a major reason. Absence of a non-availability of the judges is another reason. Less uh, where they can use technology and they're not using big is another reason. And of course, the infrastructural short uh, callings. And if you look at India Justice Report state rankings of the judicial system, do you know this? The state of West Bengal is right at the bottom. Right, right at the bottom in infrastructure, in vacancies and um, other things, procedural issues and pendencies. In fact, it's almost at the bottom. So while prioritizing having a death penalty, which exists now, for instance, in any rape case where you have a murder, obviously many rapists commit the murder so that they avoid identification. And they also want to distort the crime scene to get, I, get linked and somehow get the benefit of doubt. So crime scene got distorted and therefore, as I said, getting murdered. So murder is on the statute book for life for, uh, as death penalty. That's why we've been having death penalties for nervous cases, etc. We have. But in the case of rape, was the, what the new law has brought in is for the mm. minor. Is for the minor. Mm. But hmm. now it also can be for the major, but the major is already there. Because in hmm. this case, in case Abe case, it is a murder hmm. as well. So you hmm. had the death penalty. All you really needed, all you hmm. really needed was a fast track court. And hmm. put it put it on, on, on notice that there will be no adjournments according to the new law, no adjournments. And according to the new law, where it's very clearly written and hmm. it empowers the judges to restrict the adjournment completely. And number two, it also mandates that if the judge is on leave or is or has some reason not to attend the court, will make a replacement option. So that hmm. means there is no court without the judge of the death day. You know, the question therefore very simply is, can more stringent laws or can death for rape really play a deterrent or serve as any kind of deterrent in ensuring women's safety or are, are we merely just, just scratching the surface of the problem? 
look, it has a, a it has a, a public perception. When the judge judge gives a death penalty, it has a public perception. One benefit. Second benefit it has is it provides a closure to the victim. After all, the judge, the just, justice is also for the victim. How does the victim get a closure if the person who perpetrated the crime also does not meet the same, same uh, situation? So therefore, it benefits the victim. It also gives a public perception on, of the judiciary. But the problem is it's getting too delayed. It's very delayed because of the adjournments. And in fact, the whole system is not victim centric. The accused is interested in greater delay. Now, even in the judgment, there's an appeal over an appeal and finally goes to the mercy petition. Even the delay in the mercy petition being finalized, then even after the mercy petition has been rejected, it continues to hang around and he starts to somehow uh, fall through the cracks. I think those delays have to be now trapped. And that is what the new law hmm. has done. New hmm. law is victim-centric. If hmm. we all sincerely implement the new criminal hmm. procedure code which has come in, these hmm. delays will get curtailed. So, you know, finally, I'll just ask you what more really needs to be done at the policing level, at the ground level? Policing level has no choice but to be professional and not to fall a prey to any pressure at all because it's accountable to the court and no conviction can happen without solid evidence. And evidence it can come only through good investigation. And now the new law mandates so much of forensic use that now it's becoming more um, uh, unbiased. It has to be scientific. So therefore, the policing, whatever it has to do manually, like recording the fire urgently. Number two, protecting the scene of crime. Three, bringing in a forensic team right away at the earliest so that everything is scientific. Fourth, Produce the uh, charge sheet, the case, as soon as possible for, for, for going for a, a request for a fast track court and then apply the law for no adjournments. Keep it, that means the prosecution must keep it victim centric. At the moment, so far, all our processes by and large have been accused centric. A mm. judge is in, in favor, absence of the judge is in, in favor, non available, mm. not, not having a fast track court is in its favor, the appeal over an appeal is in its favor. Risk. Mm. So at the moment, who's speaking up for the victim? So the new laws is victim centric, provided we implement this in letter and spirit. All right. Well, Dr. Kiran Bedi, thank you very much for joining us on the show. You know, I want to begin, Sushmita Dev, by asking you as a lawmaker yourself um, and as somebody, you know, who is a, a member of parliament from the Trinamool Congress, the government in West Bengal that has passed uh, the latest anti-rape bill demanding the death penalty. I want to understand from you, do you believe as a lawmaker that passing more stringent laws against heinous crimes uh, against women is really the solution? Or do you think that we're merely just scratching the surface? I think crimes against women uh, need a two-pronged approach. One is preventive and the other is curative. And uh, by doing just one without doing the other doesn't work. So, for instance, if uh, we make the law more stringent, we all know that it only kicks in after the rape has already happened. The damage is, damage is already, uh, already done. So what is it that a stringent uh, punishment ensures? It's a reflection. Our laws are also a reflection of how our society feels about uh, certain crimes or it's a reflection of our morality. But I can tell you this much. We cannot undermine the power of... Uh, uh, of the uh, harshness of the punishment because it also gives a message in the society that what is it we feel about it and how do we look upon it as a crime you know i'm very so, like glad I as a lawmaker you know, i'm very glad as a lawmaker you admit to the fact that this is just one part of the solution and that we definitely absolutely. can't you know wash our hands of the problem by saying that oh we've passed a law which says that you know now there'll be the death penalty because i also want to come to conviction rate if you look at what the conviction rate in rape cases is the data is abysmal it's 28 percent that's nothing yeah i you are you're absolutely right in giving that data and i you know the different ways of 
uh, putting that data across. Uh, uh, but be that as it may, uh, I believe, for instance, that um, you know, I'm just see the pe what people don't want right now is what about right that uh, this is what's happening in Uttar Pradesh and that's what's happening in Jhansi and all of that. But you see, the fact is the people uh, who are uh, protesting on the streets of Calcutta or Bengal, if hmm. you like, what is it they're demanding? I think one, the first thing that they're saying is, this is not a political movement, this is a people's movement and don't try to politicize it. Hmm. It's the first thing they're saying. Hmm. And the second thing which is upsetting them is the length of the investigation. You see, because people tire out it becomes it becomes traumatic for the victim's family and friends if yes. you like and one thing they are also demanding is capital punishment that is very much a part of their uh, uh, of yes. their protest so i think if you take all these three things into account hmm. when um, a government is in place and government is about accountability. Right. The government has to react to what people are saying. But I also want to finally just ask you before I move on to other panelists, as a lawmaker, as a member of parliament, what do you then make of the data that is available of crimes that have been committed against women by people who are in power, whether it is members of parliament cutting across party lines or whether it is members of legislative assembly, again, Sushmita, they're cutting across party lines. I'm not talking about one government or one party. I'm saying as a woman Absolutely. lawmaker, what do you, how do you look at the data that is available uh, uh, in the public domain of people in positions of power who've been accused in heinous cases of crimes against women? Absolutely. I mean, that has also been written about, uh, you know, after this incident in Kol Kolkata happened, I think uh, doesn't matter who the rapist it is, it's a crime and we condemn it. But if it happens to be a public representative, I think it is a worst kind of example and the worst kind of a situation. Okay. And uh, I, if you're accused of it and if there's prima facie evidence against you and then there's a charge sheet against you, I feel that parties should definitely ask their public representatives to step down or stay away from politics yes. till well, that reaches a logical conclusion. Okay, well, I, you know, it's, I, I really appreciate that you say that because according to the ADR data, Bengal has the most legislators who are facing cases against women. So we really hope that what you say actually echoes beyond this show and actually results in some impact. Uh, uh, I know you have to go, so we'll let you go, but I want to quickly I'll, bring I'll in... Just say, I'll, I'll just say one thing is that there are also uh, politicians are in such a if you like such an adversarial kind of uh, uh, you know uh, profession hmm. that sometimes they're targeted so i think it will be very careful that unless there's a charge sheet unless there's a conviction I think you have to be careful how you treat it because okay. vendetta and well, it uh, definitely can't be ignored. Big, uh, you can, you can add politics. you can add riders, but it definitely, definitely can't be not. ignored. That data, like you said, definitely is out there not. in the public domain as well. I appreciate you joining us and Absolutely. answering that question. Let me quickly take Thanks. this to Priyanka Tibrival, the spokesperson of the BJP, also who's with us. Uh, Priyanka Tibrival, you know, the question of lawmakers aside and criminal cases against lawmakers aside, as a woman and as a woman who represents, uh, you know, the, the biggest political party in the country. Do you really believe that giving a stringent punishment such as a death penalty is the solution to the kind of crimes against women that we are seeing? Because we did hang Nirbhaya's rapists and nothing's changed after that. Hi, very good evening to uh, you and all the co-panelists. See, I just heard uh, Ms. Rushmita when she was speaking about curative measures and preventive measures and I would not agree less to this thought of hers. Because there needs to be a cure for what is happening. Only, uh, you know, trying to prevent it or uh, whatever after whatever has happened to give punishments. I don't think it is working out because as you mentioned, the case of Nirbhaya, I would also like to mention the case of Dhananjay, where he was hanged in uh, West Bengal, although uh, the victim was uh, from my school only, my class only. So when we were kids, at that time, this took place. And then I believe that when I got married, at that time, this person was given the punishment. And thereafter, I had also seen, and you know, I would like to say this today, hmm. I had seen people on the streets of West Bengal holding candles in their hands where they were saying that they do not want death penalty for Dhananj. 
Now, what would you say? So, whatever today we are seeing in India, everybody, you know, uh, I'm also a part of it. I'm having a lot of anger. Ang I have that anguish in me that why this has happened and that person needs to be uh, punished. But, but my, que but my then, question, therefore, is the solution that we've come up with is let's make stronger laws. Let's put the death penalty in place. Again, Whereas history has shown us the death penalty in place doesn't change anything. I'll come to this. Now, when we were saying, now, see, whatever has happened in Bengal, we all know that uh, they have come with this new law, Aprajita. But it is not that we have lesser laws. Whatever laws and sections we have today, there, uh, there are punishments for rape. But is that making any impact or effect? That is the bigger question. Yes. Now, here also, when uh, Aprajita, now let, let me just come to this. Like when I heard Ms. Sushmita was talking about curative and preventive. Now, in order to have certain preventive measures, this law which has come in West Bengal, Aprajita, in this, uh, the chief minister, she said that there is a scheme called Ratri Sati, where she's saying that women will be urged not to step out from their houses in the night. Is that a solution? What is it? Is it a solution? Okay. Is are there certain kind of uh, action you are taking? No. What so what's the point that, that you're making? Out? What's the point that you're making? The point is that uh, this is not protection. It is oppression. Where we are talking of a society of equal rights for women, there you are saying that women should not, because they are not safe, they should not step out of their house. Okay. So what is this? Well, well, I don't, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to get into the politics of it. I had representatives of political parties, including a member of parliament, because I think there are questions that really need to be asked of our political representatives. Yashavardhan Azad, is this then a policing question? Is this then more an implementation question? And are we just completely barking up the wrong tree by just changing laws every now and then? Why we change laws is because uh, changing laws is easy. Making laws is very simple. So we resort to that as a political gimmick. And the real reason is because we are absolutely so poor in governance that neither can we implement the laws or nor we can reform the institution. So that's why it's very, very simple that whenever there is any problem, we say we'll have a tagada law. That's what happened in NEET. And that's what happens everywhere. What is tough is, and unfortunately, whenever you, there's no point discussing this with lawmakers because every party has its own share of criminals and especially who have been arraigned against, uh, you know, crimes against women. So there's no point. I mean, actually, this is what they can resort to. What is tough is, and they never talk about it, unfortunately, the politicians who are supposed to discuss this is that why you don't even have decent hospitals or the women doctors or, or the provisions in the Nirbhaya uh, you know, uh, laws that we can implement. Look at the, look at the negligence by the politicians by, in the usage of state funds. As of now, only 37% have been used. Hmm. Now, let's come to the institutions. Unless you have a speedy trial, unless you have an effective police, unless you spend more on forensic science, technology, and unless you have a good prosecutorial system, you can't have, a, you know, a good conviction. Mm. And that's why you have only three out of ten as of now. Nothing is said about that. No progress is given about this. And therefore, situation will remain the same. Two more things. You see, when you have an inside act, it's a rogue act. For example, somebody from inside, a janitor, commits, uh, you know, a crime in school. Hmm. or a person who has access to the hospital commits. It happens all over the world. Hmm. These are rogue elements where you can stop by robust security methods employed by the heads of administration. Yes. But the same place, Maharashtra, where you had the toughest bill, you had a student nurse going by rickshaw and she was raped by five men. That shows you the, you know, the, the, the air of lawlessness and it happening in other states too. But... We are not able to do it because even now, you know, if you see the latest, you, the scene of crime mapping where you need the most sophisticated forensic technique, equipment, so that you take that yes. evidence immediately, send it to the FSL, is not there. So no accountability. It can only be change of laws.
You know, I think I think you've answered that question of whether we're barking up the uh, the wrong tree very, very clearly. I think we have a very clear answer to that question that I asked you. Um, I want to very quickly bring in Shobha Gupta. She's a senior advocate of the Supreme Court, which has also been uh, Bilkis's lawyer. And, you know, this case doesn't connect Bilkis, except that one can't help draw parallels about how, you know, we have state governments passing laws to hang rapists, demanding death penalty, all this echo about death penalty when we actually have you know, Bill Case's rapists walk free. I mean, that that entire parallel is being drawn over and over again. But uh, but that aside, I want to ask you very simply, as a senior advocate of the Supreme Court, how does this work? I mean, you know, this comes as a concurrent list subject, so therefore every state can go ahead and make its own laws. But, you know, the death penalty, you can appeal in the Supreme Court. Uh, what, how does this changing law time and time again actually impact these cases going forward? If you can just, you know, explain for the benefit of our viewers, does this really, changing rape laws, does this really change anything to that under 30% conviction rate that we have? Does it make a difference? I believe the answer would be in, in a very simple thing that go, go and look at the past. Hmm. So after Nirbhaya, you had an amendment. Hmm. The laws were made little more harsher. Yes. That was 2013. Right? Yes. You subsequently, after Katua, had 2018 amendments. Hmm. Has that changed anything? Hmm. So as the first co-panelist said, we don't mind that maybe one of the things you might do, make it if you ask me personally, I would say, okay, if, 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 if that solves, please hang every rapist immediately the moment you come to know about the case. Hmm. My question is, how does the West Bengal government actually came to realize what is that scientific assessment or analysis of the data available? Hmm. That now this is the miracle, this is the, you know, magical wand I got in my hand. I'll, I'll, uh, aggravate or I'll increase the punishment, I'll make the punishment more harsher. Hmm. Henceforth, no rapes, at least in West Bengal. Are we saying this? But I want to ask you, Shobha Gupta, like I said, as the as the as the senior legal voice on the show, you know, all these laws that have been passed in different states, whether it's West Bengal, Maharashtra, Andhra, Madhya Pradesh, there's law in Arunachal as well. I want to ask you very simply, setting up a fast track courts, passing a law saying fast track courts will be set up passing a law saying that there'll be speedy trial, do, the, does, do these laws actually result in anything changing on the ground for the cases that are going on? It doesn't because we don't act upon the laws. You have fast tracking system since long. Yes. How many times to see, do you see uh, investigation completed in a week's time, trial finishes in 15 days time, the high court appeal finishes in another 15 days or 20 days, Supreme Court appeals finishes in another 15 days. Hmm. Unless you do the fast tracking up to the last court and treat is one of the serious national pandemic. Hmm. The judges should make sure they, ha they have the designated courts up to Supreme Court and they're actually taking the matters with the fast track speed to make sure that the final verdict come before the memory fades. Okay. Well, I think, I think that's a very important point that you make. I want to just very finally, I'm completely out of time, but I want to take the final question to Yashavardhan yes, Azad. Do you believe death serves as a deterrent? I think that's the larger question of it all. Nowhere in the world, Rishika, you know, harsh punishment has led to falling crimes. That is not a deterrent at all. Because you see, crime is, uh, uh, you know, uh, done by the criminals for various reasons. And none of it is a very, very a minuscule part is attributed to the punishment. Do you think they look at the punishment before they commit a crime? In fact, each of these cases have to be investigated. There have been studies also by psychologists. And it's clearly proven that death will never be a deterrent. Okay. But a strong legal system, an able environment will be able to really cut down crimes. All right. There are no there are no short answers and no correct answers, but I think uh, you know what you've explained to us pretty unequivocally is that this definitely is not a solution. We're merely scratching the surface of a much larger problem by just changing laws. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm afraid I'm completely out of time, but that's all the time we have on We the People. If you have tuned in tonight, thanks very much for watching.